Something that's often said about vehicles is that the cars themselves are just computers on wheels. Everything from passenger restraints to the powertrain itself is controlled by modules. Modern vehicles can have upwards of 30 of them. Each of these is a self-contained computer, purpose-built for a specific set of tasks, and they must have some way to communicate with each other to allow the vehicle to function as a unified system. Back in the 1980s, engineers developed a new protocol to allow these modules to communicate with each other in a standardized way and form what's known as a controller area network, which I'll refer to as CAN. While other protocols such as automotive ethernet have started to pop up in recent years, CAN is alive and well in today's vehicles. By accessing these networks, we can begin to understand the signal shared between the modules and start to identify specific messages that trigger functions such as unlocking doors, turning on and off the headlights, and even how the vehicle's steering, braking, and acceleration work. The easiest way to access your vehicle's CAN network is through its OBD2 port. OBD, which stands for Onboard Diagnostics, has been mandated in vehicles sold in the U.S. since 1996 and can be found under your steering wheel and dash right here. Sometimes the port will be very hard to find and tucked away like in this Toyota. And other times it'll be on the right side of the steering wheel like on this Honda. Since this OBD2 port is only mandated for emissions compliance, you won't find one on Teslas or some other new electric vehicles. If this is the case for you, or if you don't have a vehicle to get hands-on with, you can use IC Sim from Zombie Craig to get hands-on with CAN anyways. We'll have a video on this coming soon. CAN's physical characteristics are fairly simple. It's a two-wire serial communication protocol that has many modules sharing the same bus. This means that every module on the bus receives every single other message that every other module on the bus sends, which is what makes the OBD2 port so interesting. Having only two wires helps keep the cost and weight low for the vehicles that can easily have over a mile of cabling inside of them. The data on the wires uses differential signaling to ensure robust reliability in the relatively unpredictable environments a vehicle may find itself in. This means that one wire will have its voltage drop by a volt when it's signaling the change from a zero to a one, and the other wire will have its voltage raised by a volt when it's signaling the change from a zero to a one. Because the CAN protocol uses two different signals with voltages moving in opposite directions, it's less susceptible to errors from electromagnetic interference and other electrical noise on the bus. You can identify CAN lines by using a multimeter to identify a resting voltage of around two and a half volts from ground. Now, because these lines will be transmitting data and the voltages will be going up and down, you may notice that the CAN high line will average slightly above 2.5 volts, and the CAN low line will average slightly below 2.5 volts. On an OBD2 port, you can find the CAN high line on pin 6 and the CAN low line on pin 14. On each end of the CAN bus, between the high and low lines, there is a 120 ohm terminating resistor. This is necessary to maintain the voltage differential between the two wires, otherwise they're just connected and sharing the same voltage. Now, let's talk hardware. You'll need a few things to hook up to CAN. And affordable options seem to be coming out of nowhere. Here are a few CAN to USB adapters that we use and recommend. We really like the cheapest one from Innomaker, but in our experience, their availability is intermittent from Amazon and AliExpress. Check the description for links where you can find them. If your tool doesn't have an OBD compatible connector to plug directly into the vehicle network, it probably has a DB9 connector like this one. You can still connect with an OBD to DB9 cable, but double check to be sure OBD pins 6 and 14 correspond with the high and low CAN channel pins on your DB9 tool. Once you're connected and your Kali virtual machine is up and running, we're going to make sure the adapter is connected to the virtual machine and not the host. To do that, Move your cursor to the top, open up this menu bar, click on player, removable devices, and find your adapter here. If this line says disconnect to connect to host, that means you're currently connected to your virtual machine. Once you're connected, we're going to bring the adapter up in Kali. To do that, type sudo ip link set up can0 type can bit rate 500,000. This will invoke the IP command, bring up the interface called CAN0, it's going to use the CAN protocol and set the bit rate to 500,000.
The bitrate describes how fast the data is being sent across the bus. The three most common bitrates you're going to find are 500,000 like this, 250,000, and 125,000. Now, you can use an oscilloscope to verify the bitrate, or the easiest way is just to change the bitrate to all three. So to do that, we're going to type sudo ip link set down can0. Then we can bring the network back up with sudo ip link set up can0 type can bitrate 250,000. Simple as that. Since my vehicle's baud rate is 500 kilohertz, I'm going to use the up arrows to bring the CAN interface down, and then I'll go back up to the previous command to set it back up to 500,000. Now, once your interface is up, and you can check with the command IPA, and we can see it right here, you're ready to use CAN utils. So, all you have to do is type can dump, which is the dump utility in can utils, and then specify the interface, can zero, and you see traffic. Now if you see traffic, you can just quit the can dump with control C. And if you don't see traffic, make sure your connection's good between your OBD port in your computer, make sure your interface is connected to your virtual machine, and double check your baud rate just for good measure. As an aside, if you only see a few packets coming through, or if you're confident your setup's correct and you don't see anything, your vehicle may be equipped with a security gateway. A lot of the newer vehicles have a security gateway filtering the traffic between the CAN network and the OBD2 port. If that's the case for you, you can follow along with IC SIM or tap directly into your CAN bus, which we'll cover in another video. Now that you see traffic, you probably want to know what it means. Can dump breaks this output into four different sections. The first section identifies which CAN network the data came through on. Vehicles can have multiple CAN networks and you can have multiple adapters connected to them. So it's important to understand which adapter is reading the data that you're seeing here on the screen. The second field is the arbitration ID. This ARB ID identifies the message to all of the other modules on the bus. When a module sees an arbitration ID that it's programmed to listen to, it can perform the action that it's designed to do on the car. The third field is the data length identifier, which tells you how many bytes long the data packet's going to be. This is eight for now, but you'll see with some other protocols later that that can extend to include more data per packet. The fourth field, or the data field, can carry all kinds of information on the bus. This is where the juice is. So, we're going to be looking for things like steering wheel position, or the blinker position, or information like the VIN of the vehicle, and that'll all be flowing here in this data field. In the next video, we'll be going more in depth with CAN utils and learning how to identify and reverse engineer what some of these signals do. I hope you learned something from the video. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments, and if you have any tips or tricks for those just getting started, start the discussion down below. Block Harbor building great solutions for automotive cybersecurity to keep mobility safe.